people, the MLS clubs and the owners, they're very engaged with the community. That's right. a very important, um, that's a very important statement that, you know, that um, the MLS have with their, their US, their MLS clubs, right? So mm -hmm. we are very engaged with our community. Uh, we are mutual cultural country and in California, it's already a very mutual cultural uh, country, right? And state, I mean, yeah. you have people from all over the world. Our, our locker room in the first team has more than 14 or 15. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Sporting Global Podcast and today I'm here with Bruno Costa and Bruno, how, how are you? How's, uh, how's everything going? All good, um, always a pleasure, thanks for the invitation, I think it'll be a good, good time to speak a little bit about, you know, my, my football career, we call soccer in the USA, but as a yeah. Brazilian, we like to always call football. <laughs> yeah, no, like as as a your fellow your as a European, you know, uh, it's it's football all the way. Luckily, we have a global global audience, so you know, it's people from all over the world. So you can just stick with football, you know. But I I remember when I was uh, I was studying in California and I was talking with you know San Jose Earthquakes. Obviously, you're working for them, but like you know with uh, with Sacramento uh, Re Republic, you know, and then the teams down there, and there was like. First thing you got to do is just you got to say soccer. I'm like, that's pretty hard for me. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> it's pretty tough just changing that. And I guess, guess you know how that feeling is as well. You know, just have to swap to, to soccer. It's not the same, you know. But it's always always good. I mean, the, the game has been growing a lot in America, and that's very important. Um, yeah. 2026 World Cup is coming to US again, and so it's always. Always good to, to talk about the growing of MLS, you know, one of the fastest growing, you know, football leagues in the world. Yeah, no, it's it, it's a lot of exciting things happening there, and of course, like you know, it's uh, it's been fun watching watching the journey. It's still a very young league as well, in in terms of professional league. So it's it, it it's it's crazy to see the the amount of big step that has happened there. But before we, I guess, go into more like how the MLS and like, you know, your journey working with the San Jose Earthquakes has been like, why don't you, why don't you take us a little bit to like how your journey in the sporting series began? You just sh yeah. share a little bit more about like where it all started. As you can see my, my back here, I'm in Brazil right now. I came, uh, I came from Brazil to do some working for sure. Cause there is a lot of Brazilian players, you know, moving to the league right now. So I yeah. came to take a look at some opportunities to the club. Nice. I'm I'm from Brazil. I went to college in the US in 1995. I was, you know, um, 15 years old. I finished my high school. Then I played college soccer for Florida International University back in Miami. Nice. Came back to Brazil in 2001. That's when I was only 21 years old. But uh, unfortunately, I couldn't play anymore. I got a two very bad ACL surgeries on my knee. But, uh, you know, I came back to, to, to Brazil and went to Rio de Janeiro to finish it up my sports management degree. I applied for an internship in the Brazilian Federation, CBF, the Brazilian Football uh, Confederation. Yep. After three, three months, I was hired as a full-time. I started working with the Brazil, you know, they had like a master team, you know, the, the, the guys that used to play for the national teams, like Romário, Bebeto, yeah, yeah. Franco, Duga. And after one year, I was promoted as a, you know, uh, you know, manager of soccer operations for the Brazil youth national teams. Nice. This is why you guys can see all these, uh, these jerseys on, on my back. <laughs> you know, um, um, I know my parents. I know my parents' house right now in Brazil, and they right. keep a little bit of my history here, and I right. think it's important for me. So right. I worked ten years. I worked ten years for the Brazil national team. After I became chief scout for all the Brazil youth national teams, and also a scout. Yeah. For four years on this journey, I was also um, academy director for the Fluminense Football Club, one of the top top academies in Brazil. Right. But the desire to come back, you know, to go back to America, to go back to the U.S. to help and participate in the growing of MLS was something that I always, you know, um, I always had inside my heart. Mm. So in 2016, yeah. in 2016, I I received a phone call from Ronaldo, the Brazilian Ronaldo. Um, and one of his partners, um, they had a share on the club in the U.S. called Four Lauderdale Strikers. He used yep. to play the second division in the U.S. Uh, right. NSL. Yep. Uh, 
uh, to become their, you know, their general manager. Uh, after one year in this club, uh, I moved to MLS to work for the San Jose Earthquakes as a, you know, uh, director of scouting and recruitment for the for the MLS club. So it's been already five years inside inside MLS. Next year is going to be my sixth year. So it's been a pretty pretty amazing journey in the last twenty plus years in my career. Absolutely, I can imagine, and uh, you know, it's. Uh... It's just also having that, I guess, perspective from from working for a national team and a club team, you know, which which in a sense is two different things as well. And and I guess like just, uh, you know, going a little bit back to how how your passion for scouting came to life and like sort of like that role, like what was it about that that kind of like you know intrigued you and that said like okay, this this is going to be my path, you know, in football. Well, it's. I always like to analyze the game, even though when I played, I was, you know, I was team captain. I always like to, to do the speech in the locker room. I, I always like to study the game a lot. Mm. But the funny thing is I never want to be a coach, right? right. I, I always right. want to be involved on the, on the technical side. I mean, I have been an academy director. I have been a general manager, chief scout. So all those, all those positions inside football, they are, they are uh, they link to each other because mm. you gotta know about uh, about everything. So when I when I started working for the Brazil national team, as I said in 2001, at 21 years old, yeah, I was very involved in, on the management side, organizing trips, camps for the national teams, contact with the clubs. But back then, we didn't have a scouting network, right? And we didn't have a scouting uh, environment like we do today. So mm. I used to go with the Brazil national team coach to watch tournaments, analyzing players. And I start to get a lot of involvement in those situations. So yeah. that was something that started catching my attention a lot. Mm-hmm. Understanding players profile, character, you know, and I was very fortunate to, to get such an amazing youth generation coming, coming from Brazil. In my first, my second year working for the youth national teams, we won the under 20 World Cup in 2003. In, in Emirates, and we also won the Under-17 World Cup in Finland. That was the first time ever that a national team won both youth uh, World Cups in the same years. And Brazil also won the 2002 World Cup in right. Japan and Korea. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Being so young and participating in those uh, amazing, amazing, you know, achievements was already something that you know marked my life forever, for sure. Can't imagine. I can imagine, and and yeah, it make, makes total sense. You sort of like you know naturally just grew into that uh, sort of aspect and I guess like you know from a uh, aspect of not wanting to be a coach it's sort of like the the the, the second most natural thing based on kind of like I guess where your your approach and the angles that you were having going going into your different kind of roles uh, up through your experience and and obviously now you know being the head of scouting and Santa like earthquakes uh, you know what uh what are some of the things that you're doing today? Like, what are some of your key tasks or responsibilities that, that lays into being, you know, the head of head of scouting? Yeah, um, when I came to the when I came to the club in 2017, uh, uh, was very important the communication that I had with my sporting director mm-hmm. to organize it, the whole pipeline for the first team, second team, and also for academy, uh, right. along with along with head, head of methodology. Uh, mm. uh, discuss about what kind of game model and how methodology you're going to have to link on the player's profile. We're going to be looking. So my job was to create this KPI, this key performance indicator yeah. by position based mm-hmm. on our style of play and also understanding what kind of players I had to recruit for academies, what kind of players are going to be recruiting for a second team, and also what kind of players are going to be recruiting for a first team. Mm. Once we have everything set up, we start creating our scouting network, then identify people that could be working for us and also bring information and reports on players for us. So right. uh, we, we, we start everything from scratch for the academy. Mm. We only had it like uh, under 18 and under 16 back then. Now we have, you know, uh, from U12 up to the second team. Yes. Uh, San Jose today is uh, in the last, last month was the second team in MLS after Philadelphia Union with more player scout for the under 70, under 20 national team. We had seven player scouts. So that's already um, showing the kind of work we have been doing in the club for the last, you know, four plus years. Right, um, right. And that's, that's pretty much, you know, follow the markets. I came to Brazil now to also um, 
um, get information and also on players that have been watching and being in South America, I can go fly to Argentina, you know, Uruguay, Colombia, Venezuela, uh, Peru. Um, why South America? There is a very, uh, we know, uh, we felt all the hardships we have been going through in the world in the last years. Mm. Economically, you know, dollar is very high right now. And even the pound in Europe, the euro for, for right. the Brazilian money, for the Argentina money, Uruguay and so. And they see MLS as a very good pathway also, not only the players, but agents, clubs, for sure. as, a, the, as a good entrance, you know, to develop players. So yep. South America became the main hub uh, for MLS teams, right? right. And so right. that's why uh, you're going to see and you have seen so many South American players going to MLS. Right. No, it makes make, makes total sense, right? Obviously, you know, it's it, it's it's not the worst distance wise too. And, and as you were talking about, like, you know, the financial upside and almost like thinking about MLS as a development league, right? Of of like attracting, you know, new new players and making sure that they have the opportunity to use it as a springboard to to perhaps Europe or, or bigger clubs down the road. And and I guess like, you know, you talk a little bit about the challenging year or even years at this point that we had with the COVID. And, and I was thinking like a little bit on like how how sort of like this i guess the restrictions that that got implied by you know the mls the, the clubs you know the different kind of you know government here how has sort of like that impacted your work with scouting and, and sort of like mapping this out you know working with the different the scout network and then and so forth um we have to we have to use and we do a lot of uh, the analytical work also to filter the information of players yeah we can we can filter it based on our game model and also how to play. Right. We have a, a intern uh, analytical work where we can benchmark it and filter players by position. So I use this filter to benchmark players all over the world. Mm. We do a first filter with uh, analytical department with our analysis uh, people, and of course, this is just uh, to make you gain more time to filter right. those players so I can go deeply and of course uh, watch those players lively because of the pandemic it's uh, of course has been very hard for everyone mm -hmm. so I like to go deep on the player to bring the best information as possible so our sporting director director of football a longer coaching staff they can make the best decision on the player signing yeah well what do we do it's filter getting all the information have a network now over the world understand the player character, understand the player situation on and off the field before mm -hmm. we move forward to make, you know, um, the final approach to sign the players. Right. Since I speak English, Portuguese and Spanish, that also helps a lot on this approach and also to bring the most accurate information um, inside the club so the club can make the best decision going forward. Yeah, it makes, makes, makes total sense, you know, and I think like, I guess, just taking from this too is that that analytical, you know, research part that you're doing, like, has been like critical, you know, in order, especially during the pandemic, because you you don't have the same, I guess, accessibility, you know, to to, to go and, and watch player as maybe as regularly as you can. So, like, those trips that you are taking, you know, you almost have to almost know at that point that it's it's going to be worth worth the the trip, right? And then the investment of of, of going there. And I know, like, you know it's always tricky you know with, with with scouting i guess in a sense of like making sure that you have have the right fit but i guess like that's where you know the utilization of data and analytics has been you know so critical over the last few years especially during the during the pandemic and um i wanted, wanted to talk a little bit about you know you know being as part of you know sense earthquakes you know the mls and and sort of like the american uh, soccer league you know for for, for 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 quite some years now and and i guess like what was there like key lessons have you brought with you you know during your time and and, and especially in terms of uh, attracting talent you, you talked a lot about obviously the south american market but like how how has sort of like i guess been some of your your key lessons throughout the years and and i guess in a sense as well if you look a it we'll look a little bit on it from a, like a future perspective like where where is the the market going of course we had to put a lot of emphasis inside a local market in california northern california mm -hmm. also develop uh, the good american player that's something we have been doing pretty well with a very good um, 
methodology in place, a very good recruitment, and also the most important for me, uh, also very good coaches, right? You need a good coach in a good environment. And when I say good environment, it's important yep. to, to emphasize it's not only about having the best structure, it's about having the right people that's gonna be able to develop it and understand the player, not only inside the field, but also outside, right? And when you will have a map, when I came to San Jose in 2017, I drove around 20, 25,000 kilometers just to watch games, visiting clubs, and understand what kind of players profile we had in our territory, right? Um, I'm gonna go like a little bit, I don't have to go too deep, but MLS has their territory, right? Um, yep, I, I yep. don't know what it's not about. We have the MLS homegrown, uh, homegrown territory where no other MLS teams, they can come on a, on a you know, on, a, on an area of um, 75 miles, that's gonna be around 110 kilometers. Yeah. And 10 players away from, from my territory. So we have a very multicultural um, region. You've been there in, right. in, in the area. So yeah. what I had to do first was to maximize all of our efforts to recruit it and have a relation with the clubs around, the, the development clubs. Right. And also have the right coach to develop the right methodology to develop those players. Mm -hmm. So we started this work uh, like strongly four years ago. And as I told you now, we have players scout for, for every single youth national team in the US. Right. We have Kate Cow today, who is a kid that just turned 18 years old, have played his first game at 15 years old for us nice. as one of the top and hottest prospects in the nation. He just made his debut, his debut um, uh, three days ago against Bosnia and Herzegovina for the US national team. That's awesome. We, yeah. have, we had five guys scout for the under 17 national team two weeks ago. We had a three guy, three guys scout for the U20. We had a three guys scout for the U15. So all this work we're doing, it's gonna help a lot of this growing and, and development also of the US soccer. Mm, and yeah. since we are in California, there is a lot of Mexican American also, a lot of uh, Hondurians, yeah. El Salvadorians, you know, and we always very open to opportunize and also Guatemala. We had players scout from every, every one of those Central America countries also for mm. the youth national team. So um, they see San Jose Earthquakes today as a very good youth reference for players development. And that's something that uh, we've been working hard inside the club and that's gonna bring a lot, of, uh, a lot of good things for the club in the future. And of course, naturally uh, for the US national team and the other national teams around. Yeah, no, I mean, like makes makes total sense. And I think, you know, like what, what people sometimes forget, right, is, is how long time, you know, the, the, this takes, you know, to, to build the foundation and especially in like the scout in essence, right? It's like the, the, the foundation that you put down is, is you're not necessarily seeing the reward in like one or two years. It's maybe like, you know, five, seven, even like 10 years, you know, having like the, the true rewards. And so integrating that system. And I know like, you know, from being in California and talking a lot with the soccer market there too, was, was how critical, you know, the Hispanic market was, or is especially for San Jose earthquakes. And I guess like, you know, as you were talking about, like how critical it is to, to I guess like, making sure that that community knows that, okay, the earthquakes are there for you and, and, and ready to, you know, make, make sure that, you know, it's, it's an entryway for, for them as well. And it's a, it's a big piece of the club's history also, um, yep. as you know, the MLS clubs and the owners, they're very engaged with the community. That's a very important, um, that's a very important statement that you know that um, the MLS have with their their US their MLS clubs, right? So mm -hmm. we are very engaged for community. Uh, we are multicultural country, and in California, it's already a very multicultural uh, country, right? And state. I mean, yeah. you have people from all over the world. Our, our locker room in the first team has more than fourteen or fifteen different nationalities, right? Mm -hmm. If you go to our academy, you're gonna you're gonna have also this mix of cultures that's and races that's so important yeah for who we are as a club right right no 100 percent. and and i guess like i wanted to you know kind of i guess in a sense finish up here a little bit with with you know with, with some key tips that you have for for some some students you know young professionals that you know wanted to work with soccer and and perhaps you know 
wants to go down like the scouting route, you know, one, one day as well. And, and uh, I'm thinking like, just from what you've seen and where you see things are going, uh, you know, going in the future, like what are some of the key skill sets they would need? And what are some of the things like, what would be their essentially best angle or best approach to, to enter this, this side of the industry? I, I think the most important thing is about passion for what we do right. and be willing to live uh, for real the passion on, on, on 24 7 that's why uh, that's why i lived my life at the beginning and i still yeah. live it but right. uh, when i was when i was 20 21 years old and i started working was i used to sit on a soccer field on a football field at like 7 a.m 7 30 a.m and leave at 7 p.m 8 p.m watching thousands and thousands hundreds of players uh, watching seven eight ten games per day um, right. analyzing and understanding also during those process which players uh, succeed to the next level and today mm. after 20 years i saw so many talents uh, getting lost and that was i was able to understand why they didn't make it on the other side i saw average players but because of their character, because of how their approach was, they became successful, right? Yeah. And also, I was, of course, I'm very fortunate to be, to to be Brazilian, to be born on a country where football is not a sport; it's a religion for us. We are born with a with a soccer ball on our feet. Right. right. Um, I was surrounded by this environment since I was a was you know I left the the maternity, and I joke <laughs> with my parents. Yeah. yeah, I mean, um, had the opportunity also to work for the national team, you know, the most successful, so, you know, soccer team in the, in, in the world. And also had the chance to work for Fluminense, who is one of the top academies in the world. Right. And be able to manage that academy for four years. Yeah. Taught me a lot of things, as I said, not only inside the field, but also outside. So just be able to give yourself time to be an intern don't look for money in the beginning just look for a place where you're going to have a mentor or you're mm. going to have people that are going to be able to teach you and to give you the pathway the opportunity to develop yourself uh, and not only as a person but the most important uh, as a professional and that's going to give you um, that's that's going to give you the opportunity to grow um you know um for the long term that's that's what happened to me Right. And, and I, I think you touched upon something important, too, in terms of the analytical side of things, of analyzing games and being analytical, right? So it's it's also like, I think, um, seems like as well for, for, for those coming up that way to kind of like just, I guess, start creating value. And, and of course, like, you know, being able to watching all these games and having the insights, but how do you utilize the data, right? That are being collected and understanding the tools and resources in order to like, you know, come in in a club and like say, okay, I can help out and I know this tool or I can learn this tool very fast because I've been looking at this, this kind of approach. And you think like that's more of the angle for, for those to start that it's like, okay, I got to focus on the analytical pr approach, like the data collection. Oh, um, I think my generation was very fortunate because we are between, I was born in 1980, and we are between pre-internet, and right. we also were able to prepare ourselves to make the after internet, and also use a lot of their human relation. And I see people lose a lot of this interaction today. Mm. They're losing a lot of this human relation and a lot of, of, of uh, this person-to-person, face-to-face situation. Right. And and moving to the Silicon Valley, I had to readapt myself. I had to learn how to use data on a way that was not make myself too robotic also. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I cannot lose all the inside, the experience, and also the, the nose and the eyes for right. talents and for players that I always had it. 100%. On the other side, I need to use the analytical part to help me to maximize my time and make myself more valuable for my club and for my work. And that's what I learned how to do it. Right. And that's why I see myself today on a learning process for sure, like yeah. always. But I see myself today much more accurate with the people that I work with. Mm. We, have a, we have a data analysis. 
we have a scout in Europe, we have people in South America, and, my, and all, we have a scout for the academy, and myself as the lead and responsible to manage all these people, um, I learned from each one of them, but I was able to mix it up the analytical part with also the cognitive, the learning, and also yeah. you know, the, 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 the experience that I, that I have on, on the game. Right. And that's obviously why having like, you know, somebody close in that club, like the, as, as a mentor and stuff that you were mentioning, right. Of like getting, getting to learn that, uh, that, that ice in the nose, right. And the experience side of the industry. So you can complement and find that, find that kind of right balance. It makes, make, makes, it makes a lot of sense. And, um, yeah, I mean, like Bruno, I, I wanted to just, you know, thank you for, for, for taking the time and for, oh. for sharing your, your insights with us. And I mean, like, I guess we could talk about scouting for like, you know, Whatever. many, many hours, <laughs> but uh, I think we just like, you know, wanted to scratch the surface a little bit, get people like a taste of, of what it's like. And we appreciate you, you know, taking, taking the time on your, you know, busy schedule to, to be with us, you know, sharing your tips and insights. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure having you, having you part well, of it. Well, my pleasure, Oli. It's my pleasure. You know, I, I, when I start talking, I just I speak with my heart. This is my passion. This is my life. So, thanks for the opportunity. I'm gonna leave also my, you know, whoever wanna follow me on Instagram. It's Bruno Costa eighty. Bruno Costa eighty. Yeah. You no know, eight zero. So it's pretty easy. My LinkedIn. It's just go there. You know, Bruno Costa. You know, um, head of scouting recruitment for the San Jose Earthquakes. Uh, my Twitter also. It's Bruno Costa eleven eleven. So feel free to follow me, ask for information, and I'm open to, you know, to talk to you guys at any time. Absolutely. Well, I think I think everyone is going to appreciate that. And for those of you who have been staying here all the way at the end, make sure to like the video if you haven't already. Uh, subscribe as well if you haven't, and make sure to sign up at sportingglobal.com to connect with, you know, like-minded people, find relevant courses. And I think also like, you know, Bruno, you have to create a profile there, right? So they can connect with you there and and, and in the of chat course. and create like some good messages. You know, it's a sports business community network, so it's, it's right up right up your alley and the people that are there. So I have I have one final, I guess, uh, challenge. I don't know if you know, but we, we have like this tradition on Sporting Global podcast where we're teaching everyone a little bit Norwegian. You know, we gotta 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 do a little bit Norwegian. So with every every video we do, we always finish with we snakkes, which means see you later in Norwegian. So that's what you that's what you gotta say. We snakkes? There you go. Perfect. Great job. You know, it's easy. <laughs> yeah, it's, not, yes, it's easy. You know, it's a great job. Next, next time I'll teach some Portuguese also. That's nice. awesome. <laughs> Let's do that next time. All right. Thank, thank you so much. You. We'll talk soon.